Welcome to Cider Chat. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the slurry. And that is something that one might want to know when bottling your cider. How to set it up, little mini tips to make it just so, to get your cider bottled condition, meaning bubbly. Hello, my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Bubbles allow the aroma of the cider to pop, says Ryan Monkman of Fieldbird Cider in Ontario. And once again, he is our guest speaker on this here episode 271. Ryan hails from Ontario. He has a cidery up there called Fieldbird, and we're returning with him this season once again for the Ask Ryan series which we first launched in 2020. So there's a whole bevy of episodes with Ryan and all those links are in the show notes to this here episode. Again, 271. Oh, nice. Right? It is kind of nice. There's over 271 episodes and counting now. And each one is archived at the podcast page at ciderchat.com. So there's a little tab there that says podcast and you'll find season one through season six. And there's also other tabs there, such as the shop tab, where you can find links to cider making supplies, some of which are going to be coming in very handy for this episode in this series right now called the Ask Ryan series, because we are talking about different products for testing your cider uh, in terms of bottling. There's also the Palms and Art page where I've done previous episodes and hopefully future episodes where we're looking at the world of art and how it's integrated in with apples and pears and medlars and quince. And maybe we'll even find a Sorbus Domestica art piece of artwork somewhere. That would be really cool. If you, if you've seen one, let me know. There's also a support page on how you could support this here podcast and the cider going up campaign page featuring all the current commercial operations who are supporting this podcast every single month to help bring it to you. And of course, there's also the Totally Cider Tours page. That is all about me leading tours both nationally here in the U.S. and internationally. And in 2022, we're going out and about into Ciderville, no doubt. And I'm making plans now. In fact, I said that just last week on the podcast. And wouldn't you know it, I got an email in from Ginger saying, put us on the list. We want to be the first to go. Uh, we're, we're down for it. And I'm stoked because I'll tell you, the makers that I know out there in the world, they want to see you. They cannot wait to see that bus filled with people, not to the brim, mind you, because, you know, it's nice to have a really big bus that's leisurely and you have sometimes your own seat, your own like little row space. Uh, that gives you plenty of room on the seat next to you to have all your bottles of cider. Oh, man, it's just so much fun. I can't talk enough about it. The people that I get to hang out with on the Totally Cider Tours, it's just stellar. It's a gastronomic experience of food, sights, and libations. Uh, so sign up. Just send an email to uh, info at ciderchat.com and put in the little subject, uh, Cider Tour. If you like, that works. It'll catch my attention or get, it'll get to me. And we'll get you on the list and start a little correspondence as we're, we're moving forward into a much brighter and open world for all. Oh, boy, I tell you, just, I, I cannot wait. All right, I'll be right back. Walking through the orchard. Walking in the orchard. Yep, that's exactly where I want to be this time of year, because right now it is blossom time. Some of the lower elevations have already seen a full bloom, but I know there's many orchards out there just waiting to pop. And I, this weekend it's going to be happening. In fact, New Salem Cider, which is in Massachusetts, they're going to have their tasting room open this weekend. And I think they're having cider donuts and some food. And that is a spectacular orchard to go to. I mean, as you walk up to the barn, you could see out in the distance, the Quabbin Reservoir, that's picturesque. And then you're looking down into this very old, old orchard that has been essentially manicured. And they produce cider directly off of those apple trees. Uh, there's a giant peri-pear tree out there in the middle of the field, so you could spot that too. 
So if you don't know what a peripere tree looks like, there's actually two of them, one doing better than the other. And then there's a in the back field, even a larger orchard. And in those trees, you'll find those magical apple pretzels. This is where Brad, who's been the pruner for the past 30 years there, has been weaving in the water water sprouts or suckers, you might call them, that come off the different branches and wraps them around into like little pretzels. And some of these are like, you know, 30 years old. So they're huge and just, they. it's like poetry in the tree. And it's really a fun place for kids to go to because they could, you know, find, count how many pretzels are up in the tree. So I hope you make it out there this weekend. I'm going to be planning on stopping by and seeing my friend Carol B. Hillman, who is the owner and proprietor of this it's just beautiful estate. She's in her 90s and she is just, she's just a grand dame. I love her to pieces. But I know that there is an orchard probably not too far from where you are and folks serving cider and they would love to see you. This is a great time to go out and visit the orchards. There's a lot of good things happening. All right, little pause. Dancing in the street. Oh yeah, we'd be dancing in the street. And last week I was dancing online, figuratively speaking, with a whole bunch of folks via CraftCon 2021. That's an online virtual conference. It's put on by the Three Counties Cider and Perry Association. And I just want to say, bravo. So well done. And it was it was like a cozy experience. If you can imagine an online experience being cozy, probably more so than any other time in our life, we've made that so because this is the one way that we get to connect right now. And I don't think it's going to be going away too much. Uh, In fact, I have to admit there's a part of attending a virtual conference that I really dig because they have something that is called networking, where you do like speed dating with people for like three minutes. And it gives you a chance to meet a whole bunch of folks that you otherwise might not be able to have that little little vignette with, um, if that works. I think that word works there. Anyways, (laughs) it was a cool time. And I moderated a panel discussion, which was called Bringing the Bellies to the Bar. And very interesting. It was with Nikki Kong, who has a cat in the glass. It's an online bottle shop for the UK. And Adam Wells, who is a cider writer. And the ever so lovely Kath Potter, who is a pommelier. And I learned a lot from each of them. Um, One little piece that one of the questions that I asked was, uh, and we were focusing on was to know who is your audience and what audience would you like to bring in? And one of the things that I heard the other panelists saying is, you know, they're looking at the craft beer drinkers. And I want to say, I'm not worried about the craft beer drinkers. In fact, I'm a craft beer drinker. I'm already here. The craft beer drinkers are not my target audience for the podcast. I'm looking at a much broader audience of chefs, people in the foodie trade, because let's face it, cider and food goes together like tulips in the springtime. It's just a match made in heaven. It's It was meant to be. So I'm looking at the folks who love that kind of gastronomic experience again, who want to revel for that. And one of the ideas later on, on, uh, you know, the kind of closing scene and everybody was just hanging out in the chat room. I really want to encourage you if you're out there as a, a cider maker and maybe as, certainly as a commercial operation, you know, look to those folks, invite them, have a social with the chefs, the cooks, the foodies. Um, and, you know, it's giving me an idea for a series. So if you know a chef or a cook or a foodie out there who might make a good guest for Cider Chat, do let me know. Send an email to me, ria at ciderchat.com. Uh, anyways, it was an amazing conference. I just, again, want to say hip hip array for that. I, I loved it. I loved seeing everybody. I needed it. I needed to see these people. And eventually I will be posting the conversation I had with the panel. Uh, but right now, if you are a ticket holder, you get to see the whole conference online and I'm going to be catching up. I can't wait to see Andrew Lee, author Andrew Lee out of the UK, an amazing person talking about his trip to Kazakhstan. Yeah, right. Kazakhstan. So cool. Smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Well, it's time to hear from our sponsor, so let's get ready for the Q&A with Fermentis. 
And again, we'll be hearing from Kevin Lane, and he's going to be discussing when is the yeast, the yeast in your cider, the most stressed during fermentation? I think this is going to be kind of interesting because this is a little bit what we're touching upon in our conversation with Ryan Monkman this week. So take it away, Kevin. Hello, my name is Kevin Lane, and I'm the Technical Sales Support Manager for the Americas for Fermentis. Uh, Really, that's a difficult question to answer because yeast undergoes different stresses throughout fermentation. And actually, um, in the growth phase, uh, if you're propagating through fermentation, then after fermentation, there's going to be other stresses as well. Uh, So there really isn't one time that it's the most stressful. Um, and it depends on what the yeast can tolerate. Uh, in fermentation, there's going to be oxidative and osmotic stress from the beginning, uh, which will be reducing over time. And then towards the end, you're going to have a lack of nutrition. So there's going to be uh, nutritional stress. And then also the ethanol that's present from the fermentation, uh, that alcohol is going to be uh, another stress as well. Uh, you, the yeast can also undergo... Uh, stresses from different temperatures, different pHs, and also the the yeast switching from aerobic fermentation to anaerobic fermentation, so from growth to more or less fermentation. Uh, that shift is going to be a stress as well, uh, including you know things like when you cold crash at the end of fermentation, try to drop the yeast out of solution, uh, that will also impart some stress on the yeast. So. It's really not that there's one specific time uh, that it's more stressful than another, but rather that there's different stresses going on constantly for the yeast. Um, And those will change throughout the process. Some will decrease through the process. Others will increase through the process. So it's not going to be a very comfortable environment for the yeast at all during fermentation because they're going to be facing all these different stress levels from from osmotic pressure to the ethanol at the end, uh, nutritional uh, depletion towards the end of fermentation. Find out more at fermentis.com. For those of you who are not professional cider makers, what we just heard might have sounded very, very scientific and, you know, what, uh, osmosis and, you know, how does that relate to what's in my bottle? I just like to drink cider. I totally get that. Uh, But, you know, In many ways, this is exactly what Ryan and I are going to be talking about up next in this next part on making the slurry, which is all about the yeast and the sugar. But to put it simply, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that little pyramid. At the bottom level, we we just need to, you know, food. We need food and, and shelter. And for yeast, the food is sugar. And the shelter is kind of like a warm and cozy environment because in a cold environment, they do not multiply and propagate. That's another word that's used in yeast terminology. So yeast really like like warm water. You know, when I'm making a slurry for when I'm baking bread, I get a little bit of tap water. I'm running the tap and I kind of put my finger underneath the tap. And if it gets too hot and it's burning my finger, I know it's going to be not nice. Yeast like kind of like the human temperature, that 97 degree zone. So I get it where it's just warm, it's comfortable for my my fingertip. And then I pour about a quarter cup or so into a pan. And then I'll put in some sugar. This is exactly what we're going to be doing for the slurry for bottling. And the sugar is what yeast eat. So they want that, that food and shelter. And then they want that safety right? The safety is just having the the intention that you're going to be taking care of them and you're not immediately going to like dose that little slurry with cold water because that will just like freak everybody out. They'll go like running out of, out of the water immediately. Not, not literally, but you know, the yeast will just stop producing. And the whole thing with baking bread or making cider is to have a very healthy environment for the yeast. And they like the basics. They like good, yummy food, And if they get stressed, then you start smelling that kind of like sulfurous rotten egg smell is like the classic thing, like the the yeast are not happy, they need nutrients. And they like warmth, Uh, just 
basic warmth, not over the top warmth, just basic warmth. So that's it in a nutshell and a little bit about what Kevin was talking about. And of course, because everybody's situation for making cider is a little bit different, it's hard to say when the yeast are actually stressed. I mean, who knows? Maybe you're arguing with somebody in the cidery and they might not like that. <laughs> you know, they might not like that. Music, some people have documented music can impact that. So, uh, you know, I believe it. it. Sounds cool to me. Totally. You know, we want harmony everywhere. So this leads me up to this week's episode with Ryan. In last week's episode, we began with the basics of me telling him about some cider that's been hanging out in my basement since uh, 2019. And it's just been sitting there conditioning, you know, all sealed up. And I know that the yeast cells in there have basically, they're, they're kaput, they're done, they're over with. They, they, have, they have left the building. But he warned me, before you do anything, Rhea, check for the sugar, if there's any sugar in there, which is critical for having a product that is shelf stable. And for me, that looks like I'm going to be bottling all this cider and I don't want to have an end product that's going to be having so much pressure in there once I add additional yeast and sugar that it actually creates too much pressure in the bottle and creates what is called a bottle bomb. Now, we talked about that in last week's episode, number 270. It's called Bottle Bombs, <laughs> Tips to Avoid Bottle Bombs with Your Cider. And you can find out more about that. I actually did purchase, uh, uh, under Ryan's recommendation, these tabs that kind of go through the process. So you, you take these little tabs and you take a couple drops of water, you take a couple drops of, of cider, and you put it in a little tiny test tube and you drop the tab in there and it changes a color. I, I took a little video, so I'll, I will be posting that. And then it gives you a chart and that color spectrum, when it's like green and stuff, it, it could be like really like no trace of sugar at all up to 0.2%. And then if it goes to orange, you know, you're in the zone where you really, really need to be t paying attention to how much more additional sugar you're going to be adding in during bottling. So this sounds really technical, but you might be like me where I've been making cider for a really long time and I've been caking it and, and doing pet knot where I don't have to worry about adding anything at the time of bottling. And now I'm kind of going back to my roots and I, I needed a recharge. I needed a reminder on how to do this all. So join with me and grab a glass right now as we join this chat with Ryan Monkman of Fieldbird Cider based up in Ontario as we talk about making a yeast slurry, that's yeast and sugar and water. And you're going to get some tips on why it might not always be the best idea to use cider to make the slurry. So there's a lot here. Enjoy it. Let's roll. If you want to be safe, that's the, that's the safety check ahead of time, mm -hmm. which now gets us into the fun math of sugar. Traditional method wine or champagne has about six bar of pressure. And to get that, they add 24 grams per liter of sugar. So kind of not rough much. math, mm -hmm. not much at all. Mm -hmm. So rough math is about four grams per liter is going to get you one bar of pressure. So yeast converts sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. And it's a mathematical equation. So as long as the yeast eats all the sugar, you can be pretty confident that you're going to hit those pressure targets. If you were trying to make something that is in the realm of like a beer, you would add three to four grams per liter um, of sugar. And if you were trying to make something that's um, like quite quite bubbly, you'd add say 10 grams per liter, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go beyond about 10. It seems like the three to four is a good, good way to go for, especially for like a hobby, yeah. not, you know, not to crank it up. I mean, most beers now feel pretty carbonated, but they're, they're not doing this com on the commercial level um, typically, but um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think three to four grams is great. We do like uh, a stubby bottle mm -hmm. of 
of bottle condition mm. and it has five grams per liter. Okay. So it's, it's one and a quarter bar of pressure in that, in that ballpark, which is um, like one and a half uh, light carbonated beer mm-hmm. or in the high end of the beer spectrum. And I wouldn't like, that's where you want to be if you're using beer bottles, which are thinner glass in that three to four range. If you know you're at dry, if you do the clean tab or mm-hmm. vermin test and you know for certain you're dry and you add the three to four grams per liter, you know, I'm not making any promises because, <laughs> you course. know, stuff goes wrong, yeah. but that's, that's your safest way to avoid bottle bombs. Doing the math here, if I'm looking at, you know, like the five gallons, which is kind yeah. of the classic size for a, a 20, a 23 but, liters or something like that. Uh, I'm looking at like 18.9 liters here. <laughs> And my okay. calculation. So that's about seven. Oh. <laughs> There's different gallons. <laughs> okay. Um, gallons are gallons are different too. What do you mean? There's there's imperial and uh, mm. there's there's two different kinds of gallons. So yeah. that's why I'm Anyways. looking at like a U.S. liquid gallon, and um, so that's eighteen. So that's about seventy two grams of sugar. If I'm looking at like yeah. four grams per liter. So that was a little bit more than originally. I was looking at sixty-five, so seventy-two grams of sugar, yeah, five gallons. Because I think anyone listening to this, they're going to be in that same boat unless they're working with like a three-gallon uh, carboy. Um, I just want to clear something up. Okay, I did the math wrong on twenty-three liters. So for those of you listening at home, hey, do I was wrong. We are not going to hold <laughs> anything against you. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean, it's amazing what you can deliver. Um, so no worries, no worries. We'll check the math. That's the key. So so we have the sugar. Um, I mean, the process, just to kind of break this down, because I know the simpler we make it, the more success I'll have and everybody else listening. You know, I'm going to rack off the cider, off, off the lees that are there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my... My tabs, whether they're the clean tabs or the um, the ferment test, um, check what the amount of sugar is. If I get like a the go light, it's not. There's no sugar left. I'm going to add. It looks like about 72 grams of sugar now, mm-hmm. and I need yeast. So yes. Um, so do I what do I do? Like I have these like little dry packets. Do I just sprinkle the yeast on that? Or I'm thinking making like a slurry and, you know, mixing it into some cider and, uh, and then pouring it back in with the sugar and then pouring all that into the, the racked over cider. So the, what, so now that you have the sugar in there and a good way to add sugar is to melt like dilute the sugar in a bit of warm water okay, and then mix it in. So it's fully mixed in. You don't have like one area with, you know, you don't want, what you want to avoid is having more sugar on the bottom than the top. Right. So if you dilute the sugar in a bit of warm water, mix it in, um, it'll be more consistent. Could I mix it into like warm cider? Yep. Uh, just for the purest of, of us out just, there that don't want to add water to our cider. Ah. Yeah, just don't don't get your cider above like thirty degrees Celsius because okay. then you'll you'll ruin uh, you'll you'll taste that burnt flavor even if it's a small amount. Oh, okay. So that's that's what the water allows you to do is to kind of bring it up without adding any yep. unknown flavors. Okay. And and we're talking you know not not a whole lot of water here. Probably a hundred mil of water in your mm-hmm. whole carboy. Okay. Um, for yeast, you're you're right about the slurry. You want a really healthy yeast population, mm-hmm. and um, the way that the the best thing to do is is a rehydration protocol of some sort. So there are really really complicated ones for traditional method sparkling that take days. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here because. Mm-hmm. The yeast need to be strong, but they don't need to be that robust. Okay. But um, 
the yeast are going into a difficult environment. So mm -hmm. juice, like fresh juice, is a super awesome place for yeast to live. Mm -hmm. They have lots of food to eat. They have like in the form of nitrogen and B vitamins. Um, they have sugar they can convert. There's it's very low alcohol juices. You know, zero percent alcohol. So there's nothing that's that toxic to the uh, yeast because mm -hmm. alcohol is toxic to yeast. But when we go for the secondary fermentation of bottle, we we got rid of all that good stuff for the yeast. So the nutrients in your cider are probably gone. Um, if you've been aging on lees for two years, you probably have a good amount of B vitamins in your cider because they get um, they get extracted into the cider from the dead cells of the old yeast. Uh, yeast are cannibalistic. But, um, and there's alcohol now. So it's not a really friendly place for yeast to live. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is make your yeast happy before you add them. Mm -hmm. So what that looks like is by getting, a, creating a slurry, like you were saying, choosing a yeast that works in difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned one of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And sorry, go go ahead. I, I don't uh, remember the name. It was a. Um, I'm looking at the Saf Cider AB1. Is what they AB1. Call it. Okay. Yeah. So we're typically looking at. Uh, that's a strain I don't know, um, but we're typically looking at what are called Bianis yeast. That's a Bianis yeast. There you go. Yeah. So uh, Bianis yeast are what make uh, most sparklings because they're really tough. They don't require a lot of nutrient and they can ferment in difficult uh, situations. Mm -hmm. So most of the yeast that have been isolated in champagne are by anise yeast. Mm -hmm. cool. So it works, works well. So AB1 is probably a, a really good choice for this. The, the next thing you want to do is rehydrate your yeast and get them used to their new environment. So the way, um, the way we do that on a commercial scale is by, and th I'm gonna mention this just because I can tell you how to scale it down mm -hmm. pretty well. Mm -hmm. We mix the yeast with a rehydration nutrient, which some people do and some people don't. Um, but I do know that a lot of home like when i used to make wine at home i was able to buy a yeast rehydration nutrient at my hobbyist store um if you choose to go that route um but mixing it with warm water around 38 degrees celsius and slowly introducing air and the cider that it's going to go into so what we do is we start off with um, nutrient and yeast in water or yeast in water depends on your approach and then whip in um, you know give it 10 15 minutes 20 minutes to kind of soak in and get accustomed to it and then start introducing some of that cider into your yeast culture and mixing it in and when you mix it in, you're trying to introduce some air into that culture because mm -hmm. yeast love oxygen. Mm -hmm. It helps them breed um, and multiply. So on a big scale, we when we do this, the water cools down slowly. And it cools down mostly from the addition of the cider we're adding into it. And the reason is we have you know a larger tank. There's more thermal mass there. So it cools down slowly. Um, when you're doing this at home, you know you put your yeast in a little bit of water. That water is going to cool down very, very quickly. So what we do when we do this in carboy size at Fieldbird for our experiments mm -hmm. is we, we call it the double boiler method. We, we use two uh, red Solo cups. And we fill the bottom one with, you know, 
warm water, so about 40 degrees Celsius. And then we put another cup into that. And that cup on top is where we make our slurry. And the larger thermal mass below keeps it warmer longer. Mm. So you kind of have more more time to get your culture going. Mm -hmm. And then over the period of about 45 minutes, introduce a little bit of cider, mix it in, introduce a little bit of cider, mix it in. And what you're trying to do is get them to almost the same temperature um, while introducing that cider before adding it to your carboy and mixing. So what that's going to do is it's going to take all this yeast that's now multiplying very quickly in this nice, warm, cozy nest you've made for it. It's now getting used to the alcohol in the cider because you're adding some. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're adding that, you're also slowly bringing down the temperature. So the yeast is also getting used to the new temperature it's going into. So everything in that process is designed to make the yeast slowly get used to its new home. And then when the temperatures are about the same, you can mix them together. um, And then bottle as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. Because what's going to happen is as soon as you add that yeast to your carboy with sugar in it, the yeast is going to start eating the sugar. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you, you want to bottle right away, and cap as soon as you can so that all of that fermentation happens in bottle. Mm. So you don't want to add the yeast and then let it sit for a day or, right. you know, add the yeast in the morning, bottle in the afternoon, just bottle as soon as you add it. Right. Have, have all the bottles washed and ready to go. Uh, yep. The cappers and everything. Yeah. All set up. Well, um, so that's brilliant. Uh, I just to kind of go over because you know the Celsius and all that. So you said about a hundred mil of water to dilute the, the sugar. That's about a quarter cup of water for like a U.S. Uh, maker here. As as little as you need to to dilute yeah, the sugar. Right, and then the temperature you said thirty degrees Celsius, which is about eighty six degrees Fahrenheit. So, that's so pretty thirty thirty eight. 38 degrees. So, so think about body temperature mm-hmm. is really where you want to be. Yeah. So that's about 100. So it's about 98, 100. Yeah, right. So I often, when I'm making, you know, bread, I, I stick my finger in and kind of, you know, taste it, not taste it, but test it that way for, you know, temperature when I'm running the water from the tap into the cup. Uh, I don't stick my finger into the food that I make. But anyways. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah. So if you've made bread with, with yeast in water like that. Yeah. Um, and a little bit of sugar. That's basically the same thing we're doing here. Right, right. But but the difference is is this next step, where you slowly introduce the cider to that or the yeast slurry, and that is a step that I've never done before. You're taking the shock value away from the yeast and really melding it together, so it becomes like a really happy medium. Uh, so that's about a 45 minute process that you mentioned there just kind of bring yeah. it up to the same temperature or down to the same temperature really. Yeah. And, and if, if anyone wants to go deep into the weeds on this mm-hmm. um, or is doing it on a commercial scale, um, we use a, a different protocol than this for bottle conditioning. So we use something called a stuck fermentation protocol. Okay. And it it's, we build up our yeast culture over about 12 hours. Say, say more. Say, how does that work? Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a very similar process. It's just slower. And um, there's, you, you do add a bit of sugar to your yeast itself. You use a rehydration nutrient. Um, you're building up that yeast culture as, as strong as you can get it. So does this mean the cider maker is sitting there for 12 hours, kind of like stirring it in and uh, monitoring that way? It sounds like a very long day. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens immediately before bottling. Uh So it's a very long day. But that that process, if if someone wants to to really go hard on this, uh, you can Google uh, stuck fermentation rehydration protocols. Um, all, all the yeast, um, 
all the yeast suppliers have free protocols you can steal mm. and they'll tell you why their products are so amazing and why you should use them. Mm. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I was wondering um, on that, so it's like 12 hours of kind of stirring it in, right? Is that what yeah. I'm hearing? So Yeah, and following following certain density parameters and uh, certain nutrient protocols. Um, if if we're talking four or five grams per liter of sugar, that's not necessary, uh, especially on a small volume. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives, as, as a commercial producer, doing something like that gives me a little more security than like the double boiler method we talked about, just because I'm worried about thousands of bottles instead of instead of 30 bottles. Right, right. It sounds a little bit of like biodynamics where you're mixing the remedy for hours sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you could use it, that. It feels the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they, they actually sell things, you know, where it kind of, you know, does this like little loop of mixing. And I've seen the world's greatest cider makers with those little contraptions in their back yard. Uh, I wonder if you could use that, but maybe that's... A- yeah, I... Uh, I So when, when making, that's actually a really interesting thing you brought up because I talked about how introducing oxygen is important. Right. And... When, uh, when I do these long yeast cultures, I dynamize them. So dynamizing is a biodynamic principle that you were talking about mm-hmm. where you swirl the solution in one direction until the vortex starts, mm-hmm. and then you change the direction you're stirring in. Mm-hmm. And it's chaotic and splashy and folds in lots of air. So, so it's a, are, a are neat you- connection yeah, no doubt. I mean, it kind of makes sense. And just for folks who might want to look up what we're talking about with biodynamics here, just an amazing, it's like the scale up from organic. It's a really a full system integration of a, a site, a farm, and, and the products. But um, not to get too off on that, but the <laughs> are you doing that by hand? So when doing biodynamic sprays, I do it by hand. You do, okay. Um but I don't want to stick my hand in a yeast culture because right. I'm trying to keep the yeast culture um, sterile is not the word, but I, I don't want other things growing in there. Yeah. I want just the yeast I want growing in there. Right. So right. for the yeast cultures, I use a paddle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they do have like a, in the biodynamic world, they have like a, it's like a waterfall it looks like because it's like slanting down and it has all these like little swirl pools that go down. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I don't really know yep. what it's called. Um, I don't know what it's called either. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's, it's a way of, you can make basically a dynamizing waterfall, um, by shaping bricks in a certain fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Well, everything kind of overlaps and brings us back to center. So, I mean, this is amazing. I, I, I I'm so glad that I didn't rack the cider off the leaves yet because I have to prepare myself for um, making sure that I know that there's absolutely no sugar in there or there is sugar in there. Anything on the crown caps? Because there's a lot about, you know, crown caps, they come in all, not dif- just different sizes, but on like the oxygen, you know, you know, it really is allowing to release oxygen or not. And, uh, yeah. and it gets complicated, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I don't it, know what to buy. <laughs> it does get complicated and it gets complicated quickly. The simple, the simple answer is to, with cider, you almost always want to be using stainless steel if you can. Um, because the pH of cider is lower than beer and can eat away at some of the beer designed things. So if you can get your hands on stainless steel, mm-hmm. that's, that's your best bet. Hmm. Um, otherwise, we, we talk about linings. So if you take a crown cap, I don't know why I'm looking around for one. <laughs> but I have bottles with crown caps in front of me, but no empty crown caps. Actually, I do. If you look at a crown cap, it um, you'll often see some sort of liner on the inside of it. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah. And some of those are designed to basically absorb oxygen. Absorb I, or, re- or release it? How, how does a crown cap, I guess it's kind of... Yeah, I don't, I don't get that, but crown caps don't really allow for oxygen ingress. 
which is where oxygen comes from the outside the bottle and goes into the bottle. There, there may be crown caps that do that, but it would, I'm just thinking, I, I, I haven't seen them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. I've never looked for them. If you have gas exchange, you're not going to have a seal. There are liners that are designed to absorb oxygen, and that is beneficial in some products. So if you were injecting carbon dioxide in a tank, like they do at large scale cideries that do injection like beer is made, mm-hmm. and then bottling, it's helpful to have that oxygen absorbing cap because it can reduce oxidation in your cider. When bottle conditioning, I just wouldn't worry about it. Right. And the reason for that is those yeast that you're adding, they need oxygen and they're going to use the oxygen so much faster than that ground cap is. With, with bottle conditioning, there's very, very little risk of oxidation. Yeah. yeah. Those are my favorite words. I just wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, you get, get the caps you can get. Right. Stainless steel is, is, is best, especially for long term. Yeah. But uh, yeah, don't like, there are things to worry about, like sugar. Yeah. But use the crown caps you can get. Yeah. I mean, all these steps <laughs> you got to take along the way here before you actually get it into the bottle, which is why I've been caking so much and not um, bottling. But here I go. Just to close the loop on something. Mm-hmm. So we talked about how you're going to add, you know, in that five grams per liter, three to five grams per liter range um, to do a bottle condition. So that's why the knowing ahead of time is so important because it's, it's very common for ciders to still have two grams residual sugar in them. Mm-hmm. So if you add five grams to that, now you're at seven grams. Right. But if you add, if you start at two and you add three, you're at five. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to know so, how many grams. Yeah. So that's, that's why I suggested doing the test ahead of time because that could be the difference between bottle bomb and not is maybe you already have five grams of sugar in there. It's just the yeast you had in there didn't eat it all. Yeah. Up to this point, I've always been an intuitive cider maker and that's worked up to this point, but now I feel like I really need to take the next step up and, um, and do the, do the science and the math. So that's awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate your wisdom as always. Well, Ciderville, I'm very happy to report that I have been bottling some of my cider, but I, I didn't, I don't think I gave the slurry enough time to really sit in its happy medium and propagate to the full amount that I normally would. And, and I feel like such a dope because making bread, I have no problem like letting that yeast really do its business and get really frothy. Uh, you know, it's patience, patience, patience. I should have waited. Anyways, I'm, I'll be going back to the drawing board and we'll see how it goes. And I will certainly keep you posted. <laughs> Talk about the mistakes, right? It happens. Uh, Next week, we're going to be back with Ryan talking about blending and getting some tips from him on that because it is a concern uh, how to blend some of these amazing little batches, should you or shouldn't you, what to look for. So we'll be ending there with the Ask Ryan series next week. Looking forward to that. I'd like to give a big tip of the glass to all the fine patrons of this here podcast and specifically some commercial makers who are members of the Cider Going Up campaign via the Cider Chat Patreon page. And that would be Ross on Y Cider and Perry Company based out in Herefordshire in the UK. We also have Insider Japan. That's Japan's first and only bilingual magazine dedicated to all things cider. So you could get a subscription to that. I know that'd be really awesome. Uh, You know, Insider Japan has been doing a lot of work, just also importing ciders to the country there and keeping the news rolling. And they, Japan has the Summer Olympics coming up, and that country is under a lot of pressure, and it's been a difficult year for them. So this is a great way to support Lee Reeve, who has been part of that from the beginning. He's the founder of it, and just an amazing guy. Also, Space Time Mead and Cider Works. Uh, I'm producing this podcast on May 4th. So I want to say, May the 4th be with you. <laughs> I do. I just have to. 
<laughs> really cool social media platform for Space Time Mead and Cider Works. So check it out on Instagram. And also Duck Chicken Cider based in London. Those folks are making cider in their flat in South London and it is really good and they're super stoked about having Perry. Uh, I love that. They're really cool people. That's Colleen and James. And also Esoterra Cider based in Dolores, Colorado. So all these good folks and so many more excellent patrons doing what they can to keep cider going up. Thank you all. Without you, we would not be here. And for that alone, I raise this glass to you. And this is the point where I say, I leave you here. This is Rio Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards. And having fun, there is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We we like cider, oh yes we do. We like palms, oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We we like palms. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!